All right, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, spidering with uh, WWW Mechanize. I know I've at least mentioned this one other time in some other presentation. Uh, I don't remember why I was probably off on a tangent. But now you'll actually get to uh, see something if the slide goes. Come on. Oh, there we go. Now it finally decided to wake up. Okay. So first, uh, a lot of you guys may go, I already know all this stuff, but so I'll go over it pretty quickly. But just in case there's anybody out there or maybe people on YouTube that don't know anything about spidering, um, basically you want a spider that follows, I said almost all links, because it really depends on what type of spider you're doing, what particular application you're using it for. Um, but basically it follows a bunch of links you know, which you kind of define which links you care about. And then it processes the content and the links because obviously it's got to pick up more links off the page to continue going places. And that's why they call it a spider is just because the metaphor is kind of like a web. Everything's connected together, thus the website. So anyways, again, this is probably really old for you guys that have been around for a while. But uh, just to give some examples, uh, like Googlebot is probably one of the most well-known ones. Uh, it's the one that goes out and spiders people's sites for Google's results. So search engines pretty much all spider everything. And that's kind of where I said almost all, because if you're Google, you want pretty much all links except for the ones they're not supposed to go into, which we'll talk about that a little more later. Um, link checking, uh, that's actually the one I'll be presenting tonight is a spider that I wrote to check links off of uh, websites. Uh, sitemap generation, it can either be like a literal sitemap page that you're used to seeing on websites or uh, like a Google sitemap, which is an XML format, which actually, uh, I call it Google, but actually I think Google Yahoo and Microsoft all amazingly agreed on a format that was the same. So I know Microsoft used to be behind on the curve. Uh, at my last job, I used to submit them to Google and Yahoo, uh, but that was several years ago. So uh, for all I know, maybe it's uh, easier and better to work with uh, Microsoft now than it used to be. Um, grepping was uh, actually one that uh, luckily Tom and I had a conversation this morning and I remembered another spider that I used. Basically, we had a huge website and we'd have things like, uh, you know, maybe A-B testing on just a few pages in the website. And then, you know, the director of marketing leaves and nobody knows where they're actually at on the site. So it, as long as I could find one, I could figure out, okay, what's the unique text I want to search on here, and then just set the spider loose, let it run overnight, come back the next day, and it's got, you know, all the pages that actually contain uh, what we needed to remove. So, a bunch of other things we used it for. Uh, we had a bunch of hard hard coded copyright dates, which I later fixed to be dynamic. This was kind of before I took over the site, but. Uh, so I wanted to know every, everywhere that, you know, that date appeared so that we could go and fix all of the, uh, all the links. Any questions on this so far? Because this is just basically to the general principles of spidering. Um, okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, spidering steps. This is basically just kind of like pseudocode for what, a general spider does. It may do a bunch of other things, but the, this is just kind of the core steps. So it takes an initial URL, which is usually just the home page of a website or something, puts it on a stack, and then you pop pop it off the stack. You check to see that you haven't already visited this URL um, because you don't want the spider to get in a loop where it just keeps visiting the same stuff over and over again which actually some spiders have done. Some companies I won't mention the name of have actually had spiders that have gotten stuck 
which also reminds me, actually, some people actually deliberately try to catch spiders by generating like an infinite number of unique pages and junk like that just to mess with the spiders. Mm -hmm. I'd forgotten about that until just now. I've heard about those. Okay. Uh, then if uh, you haven't already visited it, then you uh, fetch the contents, uh, which usually most of the time you only care about uh, HTML because that's where you're going to get your links from. You extract all the links, you push any non-duplicates onto the stack. So again, that you don't visit ones you've already visited. Then you mark the one that you just visited as visited so you don't go back to see it again. And then if there are still more on the stack, you go back up here and pop the next one off the stack. Now, obviously too, this is like single threaded, single process, you know, obviously, if you wanted to do large scale spiders, you'd have to do, you know, something that's uh, multi process or multi threaded that's handling a lot more. But for mine, you know, uh, number one, I don't never wanted to kill the site that I was, you know, trying to spider anyways. So I didn't really care about how fast I can gather all the information. So I always just do it with uh, single threaded, single process. All right. Okay, I just thought I'd talk about a few of the pitfalls of uh, writing a spider. Um, you should probably make sure that you have permission for the site that you're spidering. Either that or don't get caught because if they catch you, they'll usually ban your IP or whatever uh, if they don't want you on your site. Should uh, obey robots.txt. Uh, a couple of different reasons. Although you should never use uh, going from the other end, if you've got a website, don't use this for security. Believe it or not, people have actually done that before and go, oh, well, we, we told the robots don't go in here <laughs> and don't look at our top secret passwords or our top secret corporate information. Well, believe it or not, some bots don't actually obey this. There's nothing that says they have to. So all it is is it, polite bots will check for robots.txt and will obey it. A lot of them are not so polite and they'll just ignore it in spite of everything. So, but if you're going to write a polite bot, you should obey robots.txt and don't go to places uh, it tells you not to go to. So uh, don't denial of service the site. <laughs> That's usually nice too. Uh, so you want some kind of a time delay. Unless, of course, it's your own site, which, uh, you know, like any of my own sites or the site where I used to work at, I'd run it overnight. It was never an issue. I didn't have any delays. I just hit it as fast as I could. And it was never, you know, never really caused that big of a load on the server. But again, depends on your situation and whether it's your site or somebody else's site. Okay, uh, make sure it doesn't go off the rails, like especially if you're only concerned about spidering a given site, it's really easy to screw up and have it go off and go crazy and try to spider the entire internet. You know, it's fairly easy to do if you're not careful. Um, and just make sure that all the pages you want spider are actually linked because some people, especially non-technical people, get confused by this point. And they go, well, th it's on the website. Why didn't the spider see it? It's like, well, there's no links to that page, so the spider can't find it. It only finds things that are linked somewhere. It has to have a continuous link from the very first URL to whatever given page. If there isn't a continuous link, anything that's broken in that chain, it's not going to find. Exactly. Can't find an island. And basically, you could end up with a single page island or a whole section of the site that might be an island unto itself. Uh, sometimes that's deliberate if it's like just a marketing campaign, standalone page that the only people that are coming to it are like people you mailed stuff to or sent emails to or something like that. Maybe you don't care, but if you do care, then you need to make sure you either have a link somewhere or you have to add it to the initial batch of URLs because you don't necessarily have to just start with one. Uh, my spider does just because of the way I wrote it. I didn't need anything else. But if, if you wanted to, you could certainly pass it a whole batch of URLs to start with. And you could pick up those islands if you specifically target them. So uh, any questions before comments before I move on? Okay. 
Okay, now let's talk about WWW Mechanize uh, in specific. Basically, it's like a browser object. It's got methods that make you think of a browser. It's got a back method, like a back button. Um, it is a subclass of uh, LWP user agent. So if anybody's done any kind of web work, you've most likely used that or some subset of that. There's like a simple one, I think, out there too. But what's cool about that is that means that you uh, have all of the power of LWP in Mechanize as well. So uh, if you decide that, you know, Mechanize is too high level, and you want to do something lower level, just call the LWP methods on it, and you can do whatever LWP user agent can do. Um, it's got link and form support. Mostly link support is the reason that I like to use it for spiders, because instead of you know manually or using an HTML parser or, or XPath or something of that nature to find all the links for you, it just does it. You just say, give me all the links, and it says, okay, here they are, you know? So it just makes that part of it nice and simple. And since that's a core function of a spider, to me, it just made sense to use uh, this as, a, as a, the basis for a spider. Um, automatic cookie handling. Um, it's useful for uh, spidering, obviously. And uh, also testing, a lot of people use it to uh, do website tests, especially with like form support. You can actually, you know, have it just throw random data at forms and make sure nothing blows up, that, that sort of thing. So it's also good for that. Any questions on any of that? Okay, now we will actually look at some code. Um, actually, uh, well, let's run it first. Okay, I'm actually going to spider my own website, uh, veritablesoftware.com, just because it's extremely small, so it's great to use as a test case for spiders. In fact, that's what I use since my old job. You know, I take like three or four hours to spider the entire site. It was huge, uh, but I could test it against my site, which just took mere seconds. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. It's just linkbot.pl and then a configuration file that I just happen to name after uh, whatever site it is that I'm spidering because uh, I used to do a lot of this on a lot of different sites. So it was nice just to have the specific config. Sometimes people wanted certain things so then I could set up the configuration specific to their site and I didn't have to remember it every time I ran it, which was usually once a month, which is just conveniently long enough to completely forget what you did the last time. So we'll go ahead and run that. And while we're run it, running it, I'm gonna tail the log so you can see it in action. You can see it's already done a bunch of stuff. It's just got a nice start time so I can tell, you know, roughly how long it took, especially on the large site where I was running it overnight, you know, I wasn't there to see it end, so. I just hit enter before I left for the day and come back the next day and look at the log. So it uh, gives you an end time, gives you just basically uh, messages that it's fetching whatever uh, link. And then it also gives you any errors that it encounters. Like you may have 404 errors or like this was a connection refused, um, 500 errors, whatever kind of error you end up with, uh, it'll be in here. Uh, so it gives you also the elapsed time, just so you don't have to do any math. Um, gives me a couple of file sizes, which I'll talk about these more when I get into the code. And so that is about it. This is the, the reason I have two different times is this is the spidering time. This is the actual end time of the generation of the reports. Obviously here it took a whole whopping one second extra to do that, but on a large site, it actually took a considerable amount of time. So I wanted to know how much time was actually spent spidering, how much time was actually spent reporting. So we'll just break out of that for now. And um, I'll show you real quick. Um, Have you ever done anything large like uh, uh, 
news, like Google News or something like that? Uh, no, actually. Uh, like in the, in the real world, like not, not in a work setting or whatever, right? Okay, zoom in. All right, is that big enough that most everybody can see it? All right, good. Okay, so I just went ahead and did a usage on it so you can see what the options are and you can see there's a whole heck of a lot of options. Um, I'm not gonna go over all these because the, most of them, it just depends on what you're doing, whether or not you care. Minus H is pretty much the most important or one of the most important ones because it defines the domain that you want the spider to stay on so that it doesn't go off and do other things. Then, oh yeah, actually I was wrong. See, there you go. I wrote this so long ago, I forgot that actually you can put in multiple start URLs. I must have changed that at one point and forgot because uh, I know when I first wrote it, it only took one URL. But you can put a delay so that it doesn't kill the site. Proxies, you know, uh, which pretty much stuff like this. I mean, that it's like, ooh, proxy, that sounds really cool. I get that for free out of Mechanize and LWP, you know, so I didn't really do much anything to add that feature. It was just already there. In fact, actually, I've never used it, but it was like so easy. It's like, oh, yeah, I'll just add that feature in there because who knows, maybe someday I will need it. And then you can uh, email address to have it mailed off because in my case, uh, I wasn't the only one that wanted to see the report. Several other people did as well, so it, I could add a whole list of people and it would mail them off to everybody when it was done. Um, I've got a regular expression to skip certain URLs. Like, for instance, it's kind of like having my own host.txt where stuff that wasn't in our host, or robots, I'm sorry, robots.txt, where I knew I didn't want my spider to go into certain areas of the site. I could add a regular expression and it wouldn't go anywhere under that, you know, part of the site. And also this is something Tom requested of me recently. So it took about five minutes and added that feature where um, you can actually put in things that you want included, kind of the opposite ones, specific things. And what it does is actually filtering on the report side, not on the link side. Because if you filter on the link side, you may filter out the very first URL and end up with nothing. <laughs> so it actually goes through spiders the whole site and then just filters out all the junk you actually don't want to see on the report side. Because it doesn't work very well if you try to filter out the URLs bef while you're spidering. Because you never see anything behind them. So anyway, uh, any questions about any of these options? Any of that stuff? Okay. Um, all right. That big enough for everyone? Okay. Uh, this is basically a whole bunch of configuration variables. I'm not going to talk about that. Not very interesting. And also, uh, nowadays, I'll just point out that this is use vars. If I were writing this today, these would be our variables instead. But at the time, I had to maintain backwards compatibility with some older versions of Perl. And so sometimes I did things a little older style just because I had to run it different places and I didn't always have a uh, very up-to-date version of Perl. So, okay. I'm gonna just briefly mention a few other uh, modules that I use that don't directly affect the spidering part, but I just thought might be interesting for you to know existed if you hadn't heard of them. Get up declare. Uh, that's a Damien Conway module. And basically what it does is allow you to specify the usage and it actually parses this to figure out the actual usage. So it actually figures out like if I say E and L are mutually exclusive and then I go and try to put E and L both on there, guess what? It won't run. It'll dump the usage and give me an error message saying, hey, you're using mutually exclusive uh, options. So anyway, again, I'm not going to you know, go through all of the details of how this works, but I like to use this a lot just because it does a lot of things for you easily when you've got a lot of options to deal with like I do here. Um, let's see. Okay, mechanize, we expect. Robot rules is so that it will obey robots.txt. 
Um, although actually I have an option to disable that. Again, if you're spidering your own site, you may want to ignore robots.txt. You may want to keep other robots out, but not your own. So it's an option to shut it off if you want. Okay, uh, I've got GDBM file, which uh, that is actually to keep track of. Basically, it's just, I'm, uh, if you're familiar at all with DBM files, they're just, you know, key value lookups, or at least how they're commonly used. So basically, I did that to reduce the memory footprint of this hash, especially on a huge site. Uh, literally, this spider at one point, when I first wrote it before I did any optimization, three gigabytes of RAM by the time it was close to finishing. And this was a few years ago when that was kind of a big deal. And actually, the machine I was running it on only had two gigs of RAM, so it didn't work very well. Uh, that was one of the things I did to reduce memory is now the hash is tied to disk. So instead of keeping it all in RAM, you know, obviously the trade-off is uh, it's, it's not as fast. But that's really not that big a deal because most of your time is actually network time. Fetching stuff over the network is way slower than accessing hash off a of disk. So I don't worry about that too much. Uh, date time, just for the date stuff you saw in the report. Um, I'm using DBI because I'm ASCII, actually using uh, SQLite to store the information that I generate the report out of, just because it was easier for me to do it that way than it was to do it in a flat file. I could have picked some kind of flat file and then, because I need to store it all and then I need to generate it at the end based on certain criteria, one of them being the filter that I added to say, hey, I don't want to see certain th ma things that match a certain pattern. So, okay, uh, MimeLite, I use that for email. That just There's a whole slew of email modules, so you can use whichever one you want. I just, I like MimeLite. It's pretty simple to, to use, so. Um, and then this is just a config file, which uh, actually, I'll go ahead and bring it up so we can talk about it real quick. But it's mostly just burying junk out of uh, out of the way, you know. So, whoops, that's not good. Good catch. Yeah. We'll edit that part out. <laughs> well, actually, I may have edited it out myself. I think I pulled the jack out. Sorry, John. <laughs> anyway, um, like the file name of the uh, DBM file, the from email address when it sends it. Uh, the SMTP server to use because I, you know, had to use like specific ones at work to get get it where it needed to go, and then all my SQL junk is all there. So that's that's pretty much it. Just stuff I didn't want uh, messing up the code. Let's, we'll talk about the site configuration here real quick. This is the other reason why I like that uh, the option module so much is you can actually put your command line options in a configuration file and it will read that so that you don't, again, don't have to either alias or make a shell script with all the junk. You just put it in the config file, which options you want. And, you know, some of them had completely different options because like I've got an option that give you the links only if you want to know, well, what are all the links on the site? I just want to know, give me a list of all the links on the site. Or I only want to see errors, or I want to see both. So you can pick and choose which things you want to do. So anyways, uh, probably not too much interesting other than I'll mention the reason why I put an XLS on this. It's actually a tab delimited file, but Excel doesn't care. And most people that I were, was sending this to uh, were using uh, Windows, so they could just you know, double click on the attachment on the email, it would open up in Excel and it was really easy to read that way. Uh, but it works great in OpenOffice too, which is what I actually use, so. Hey, why is the time zone important? Oh, that, good question. That was a Windows thing. When you run this on Windows, I couldn't get it to ever give me the time zone correctly. So actually, I don't actually need it here. I only have it here for historical reasons because sometimes I was running it off of Windows machines, sometimes not. 
But actually, I'm glad you brought this up because, yeah, this actually ran cross-platform fine. I ran it off of Windows, ran it off of Linux, worked great in both places, didn't have any issues, except for the time zone. <laughs> so I'd have to specify that. On Linux, it pulls the time zone from the environment just fine and works. And I never did, I guess, I never ran it on Windows enough to want to spend the time to figure out why it wasn't working so... It was just easier to specify it. So I was lazy. That's, that's the short answer. OK. Any other questions before I move on? All right. This is the part where basically I just look at uh, the first argument that comes in. And if it, uh, if it exists, then basically it says, oh, you're passing me a config file. I'm going to look at that instead of looking at any options that are on the command line. If not, then it just parses the arguments. Does that make sense to everybody? I just did it that way so that you could either pass in the configuration file or you can pass in the command line arguments depending on how you want to do it. Obviously, as I was testing, I was usually doing it all on the command line, but once I had everything established and I knew what options I wanted for which website, I just put it in a config file and boom, just pass it in. It reads all those out of there. And so either way, it'll work. Either you, you pass it in the file name or you just pass in uh, the specification uh, string. And if you don't give it a config file, it assumes that it's parsing the uh, command line, and that's what it does. So, um, why are you passing both the, the specification string and the Oh, the specification string was that big old yeah, long I'm thing. I was wondering why in the first one, why you're passing both arguments. Is it, does one supersede the other? Oh, well, because they actually do two different things. Specification uh, string tells it which arguments are allowed oh, okay. and what they do. This is saying, uh, the, the config file is saying, which ones do I actually want to use? So, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, output, I'm going to skip some of this stuff because it's not terribly interesting. I'm just setting up whether to append or clobber the log file. I put it into append mode if it detects that the last spidering didn't finish successfully. And it just checks for ex files that haven't been deleted to know and so that way it doesn't clobber the log file so that if it runs again, like you've got it on a cron or something, it won't clobber the log file so you can go back and see what blew up. Uh, most of the time, I don't need that functionality anymore, but obviously when I was first writing it, it would blow up occasionally and I'd have to figure out why. So uh, I've just got log file things, U user agent name, um, you know, anybody who's done a lot of web stuff, you know what the user agent is, just basically a string that tells you what kind of browser or you know whatever user agent you're using. So I could actually lie and say that I'm Firefox or IE or, or Chrome or whatever. But you know, I chose to play nice and what's that? Dubbot. Yeah, Dubbot. could be. All right, so here's where we're starting to get to the meat and potato of things. Uh, new mechanized object with the user agent name. Auto check is turned on by default. What that does is if you've done LWP, you know you always have to check the error state to figure out whether your fetch succeeded or not. Uh, auto check is more like a browser. It hides those behind the scenes and you know for you. But in my case, I actually care. So I do want to do the checking myself. So I turn that off. And this was a new option. I actually just made this change for this presentation. Uh, stack depth, when I originally wrote this, I'm pretty sure Mechanize did not have this option, but it does now. What that's saying is don't keep any history for the back method, because that was another thing that was ballooning my RAM, is uh. not only did I have a hash of all the URLs, but I had an array of all the <laughs> URLs. So yeah, that was a huge amount of memory. So what I was doing was just kind of reaching into the mechanized object and blowing away that array on every loop. Uh, but I discovered in the documentation, now you can just tell it don't save any history, and I don't have to do that anymore. So I took that out. 
uh, this is the all of the proxy stuff. Literally, it was like one line plus plus whatever I added for the command line options. So like two or three lines to add that feature. So it's there. Okay, <laughs> robot rules. This is where I create a robot rules uh, object and have it check for a robot.txt. Um, and if I don't tell it to ignore it, then it will parse that and it will obey that automatically transparently. So I don't, my spider doesn't even have to worry about it. Mech will automatically throw out any links that match the robots.txt that says, hey, you shouldn't go here. So that's what's nice about it is it's completely transparent to me. Uh, Mech takes care of all of that stuff for me. So, uh, which by the way, Mech is what they call it for short. So I'm gonna start using that because obviously WWW mechanizes is a lot harder to say. So this is my stack, just an array, URLs to visit. So the first thing I do is push on any of the URLs that I had on the command line, which, you know, I lied earlier and said it was only one. It actually can be multiple ones. Forgot about that. As you can see, it's not hard to do. Just at this point, all my command line has been parsed and removed from the command line. So anything that's left is a URL. That's why at this point, I, I just know that anything uh, and this was also part of the command line arguments that it passes. It just assumes anything that's after all the other arguments are all URLs, and it just stuffs them into this variable. Yeah, Tom? You know about the robot rules? Oh, uh, because the... Uh, okay, mech get robot rules parse. Okay, that's where I parse it. Hang on just a second. I'm going to have to search for it. Because I, I know there's somewhere that you add that okay. to the mech object. It's, it's premature. Yeah, we will run across it. If we don't run across it, I'll go back and okay. search for it uh, to answer your question. Okay, this is just where I do my tied uh, hash processed. Um, that keeps track of any uh, URL or link that we've already processed. Uh, open my DBI connection. Not much exciting there. Do a couple of prepares. Okay, now finally, all of that was just set up to, here we go, our while loop. This is the thing that, like I said, you just loop. As long as you've still got uh, URLs on the stack, you just keep going after them. So it just shifts off whatever the first one is on the list. And you'll see later, we keep pushing more of them onto the stack. So you just keep pushing them on one end and uh, you know shifting them off the other and just processing. So right away, I just skip any that are, I've already seen. You notice that's my tied hash. Um, I didn't want to handle, and again, this is just specific to my spider, so you may or may not want to do these sorts of things. I just didn't want anything that wasn't HTTP or HTTPS. I didn't want any FTP or any other protocols. So if it's not one of the protocols I want, I toss it out. I just uh, keep just saying next, give me the next one. So uh, here we go. Yes, this answers your question, Tom. And I knew it was down here somewhere. This is where it tosses it out if it's, if it's uh, robot.txt and we don't want it. So, so actually what I said earlier was not quite correct because I was thinking you passed it to mech and it handled it, but actually you don't. So you have to, but as you can tell, it's like one whole line to do it. It's not a big deal. So, uh, oh, okay. Basically, one of the options that um, I should have mentioned earlier was I wanted to know not only errors within our site, but one hop away. So if we've got a link to somebody's external site, I don't want to go and spider their whole site, but I do want to check just that first link. And then that way, that enabled us, if they move their content, to even realize the link was broken. Because when you've got like 12,000 virtual pages on a website, I mean, really, who's gonna figure that out unless somebody randomly happens to run across it or a user complains or whatever, you'll never find that stuff. So this is how we would do this. And we would run this once a month. Anything we found, we may remove the link because maybe the content's gone away completely. So you just, Get, uh, fix the page, take it off, and next time it runs, uh, reports clean. 
So here's where I do my logging. Unless you tell it silent, you can tell it. I don't want any feedback. Most of the time I like it though, and I just put it into a log, but by default, it'll give it to standard out and standard error if you haven't chosen to log it. So those are some of the other options I didn't mention. Okay, here is where you actually get the URL. So it gets the, uh, the content of the URL, fetches that, says, okay, yeah, now I processed it. And then this is where I'm checking success or failure and Basically here, if I succeeded, then I want to go through all the links. Guess what? I just say mech links. That's it. You know, I don't have to have a bunch of ugly HTML parsing here or, you know, functions or create my own modules to push that off somewhere. That does everything for me. It gives me all the links. Um, I believe you can also filter for certain types of links, like if you only wanted image links or you only wanted, you know, certain types of links. I can't remember for sure, so that may be wrong, but I think you can. In my case, I just wanted everything because I cared about broken links to images. I cared about broken links to style sheets, you know, stuff like that. So the, basically, I wanted all links on the page. Does the links, it expands to everything? That puts the HTTP in front of No, the but you'll see where I do that. Oh, okay. I do that later. Okay. Actually, that I do remember. So um, I also... Uh, if it's a redirect, I actually check for redirects and you'll see a little bit later where I actually format those with the kind of the fat arrow in the report so that you know that it's redirected. I don't have an example on the site that I just used, but it would actually follow redirects. But more importantly to me, it would tell me it was an actual redirect rather than just telling me, oh, it was this page because in that case, I actually cared because sometimes we had redirects we wanted to get rid of, and again, they would show up on the reports. So I would treat redirects and just straight links differently, which you don't have to do, but in my case, I cared about it, so I wanted to know. Um, I skip anything that doesn't match the host. You remember that's the part that keeps it on the site I want it on and doesn't let it run wild. I also would, this was mainly to skip a lot of JavaScript links. We had a whole bunch of links where the href was just pound. And all it does is clutter up the report with the same link, only it's slightly different because it's got the pound on the end. So you get end up getting it duplicated. In this case, I don't care, so just toss it out. Um, okay, right here, this answers your question, Tom. Right here, I'm making them absolute so that I uh, can match on them. And this is where I do the excluding. I won't go through all of that. Um, this is where I toss out links that are duplicates. So I've actually kind of filtering at both places. But that's just because I wanted to filter out if you accidentally put on the command line duplicate links, I need it to filter up front. Here, I'm filtering out links that I've parsed off of a page that I've already seen. I toss them out there too, so it just catches it in both places. Wherever it happens to hit, tosses it out. So make sure you don't get any links. Okay, here's where I'm pushing it on my stack. You remember the while loop was operating on this. So I pushed the link on the stack, and here's my uh, redirect, and here's what I told you. So it'll actually give me the actual URL I went to plus the URL that you were redirected to. And that's how it shows that on the report. Okay, this is where I insert into the database. I'm not going to belabor that. I'm just stuffing data that I need to generate a report later into the database. And then again, I'm you know making sure that the link is marked as we've got it. So. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, well, we're going to get to that. So basically, oh yeah, another feature I forgot. You could tell I worked on this over a long period of time because I just, you know, it, it started out very simple, the only a few features, and then I just kept adding junk to it that I needed it to do. One of the things I wanted to know was, uh, do we have any anchor tags 
that are broken. You know, you've got a link that links to an anchor and there's no anchor or the anchor's misspelled or something within that page. This is the part that processes that. So I'm not gonna go through all of that because it's kind of a little off topic from spidering, but basically this is where it goes through. And so I do do a little bit of HTML parsing for this, but that's because I'm kind of doing a specialized thing. So I'm looking for uh, taking the anchor name off the URL or the link and seeing do I actually have one in this page that matches that, or if it's in another page, one that's in the other page that matches that. Because uh, if I don't, I want it to show up on the report so we can go and fix it and say, hey, there's, there's a link that links to an anchor that doesn't exist. You look puzzled, Thomas. Yeah, because I thought you were going, uh, skipping like, you found it. Oh, that was only a pound. If it was a pound with no name, oh, okay. yes, okay. yeah. The good, good point of clarification, though. Yeah, because for those, those were ones where it would just link back to the same page, but it was actually JavaScript that was doing something. Um, where on these, these were actual anchors that I cared about that were named. So I'm gonna kind of skip over most of that because there's still a little bit more code and I don't have much time. Here's where, here's my else. You remember my error checking way back up there. Success, this is if it fails. Then it warns you with the message and then it has a separate insert statement to log that error so that it can later show up on the report. And then it just says, oh, I found an error. Sets that flag. Here's my sleep. If I set a, a delay, it'll sleep for however many seconds you told it to. By default, it just hits the site as fast as it possibly can. Because um, again, this was an internal tool and that's what I needed is just something that went fast. Because I mean, it took you know three or four hours going as fast as it could anyways. I certainly didn't want to stretch that out any. So this is just a special thing. The reason why I set this flag was just to avoid, <laughs> this was kind of, uh, obsessive compulsive of me, but I just didn't like the annoying error that I would get about not closing my uh, database handles and such if there was uh, an error found. So that's all it's doing is making sure that everything is happy with DBI and doesn't give me any error messages. It wouldn't actually affect anything. It would just give me annoying uh, error messages. So let's see. Oh, okay. Now again, this is checking for silent, and this, you notice, is the stuff we saw in the log, because instead of picking silent, I picked to log it to a file. So this is the hours, minutes, seconds, all that junk we saw earlier in the report, plus the file sizes that I was uh, looking for, because again, you remember that I got the tide hash to the DBM file, and I've got the SQLite file, which is generated. And that's what's so wonderful about SQLite for something like this, because I literally create a database, insert a bunch of data into it, query a bunch of data, and then blow it away at the end. You know, I'm done. It's don't need it anymore. So here's where I delete if I succeeded. You know, I untie it. And, you know, if I've got debugging on, it gives me extra information. Uh, which I didn't have turned on for this run. And, whoops, let me go up here. If I ask for links only, you remember I said either you could get errors only or links only, or but by default both. If it's not links only, then this is the error stuff. So basically what I do is the first column, remember tab delimited, but it, and I'm gonna show you in a spreadsheet because it's much easier to understand than looking at the tab delimited file. But the first column's the error. The uh, second column is the link, the bad link that had the error. And this one is the most important column. This is what pages do that link exist on? Because guess what? It may actually exist on 20 different pages. So if it's a 404, guess what? You've got 20 pages you gotta go edit to update the link or remove it or whatever. Uh, for that 404. Because again, it doesn't do much good just to tell you, oh, this link was bad. 
Well, it's great. It's like, well, where do I go to fix that link? I don't know. <laughs> I've got 12,000 virtual pages. I have no idea. It could be anywhere. So that's why I did it that way. So it would explicitly tell you everywhere to find that link. So you know exactly where to go and fix it. Um, let's see. This is just uh, where I'm doing my querying and generating the report. Again, that's not too interesting. The links, we'll just go to this part here. This is, if I didn't say errors only, then I generate the links. If I didn't say either, it's gonna do both, right? It'll do the errors, then it'll do the links. And we'll look at that in a second, the output. Um, and again, I'm just querying, and this one only has two headers. It's got uh, the link and the pages containing the link. So then that way you've got literally a link, a list of every link in your site plus every page that contains that link. Because maybe it's not broken, maybe you want to move it somewhere else before it does become broken. And that's what this report was more used for is preventative type stuff where I just wanna know, show me the stuff that's there now because I wanna go and edit this link and change it to something else. Or maybe you wanted to change it to a redirect or something of that nature, so it allowed you to find all this stuff. And literally, I guess, maybe you guys realize, because you're all programmers, but before this stuff, marketing would ask us to do things and we would literally say, we can't do that, or we can't answer that question before I wrote the spider. Because there were just the site was so huge, it's just like there's no way, and there were only a handful of us maintaining it. We just didn't have enough manpower to figure these things out. That's where this came in so great was, well, where, you know, what pages are this link on? We don't know. You know, well, basically we used to just go, well, we know a few places it is and we'll find the other ones as we come across them. Well, that, you know, that's not a great way to maintain a website. So that's why, you know, that was my motivation to do this is then we could go in and actually say, oh, okay, you want to know where this link is? We'll tell you tomorrow. And I'd let it run overnight and we'd have a list. So this is where I finish up all my database stuff, disconnect from the database, um, give error reporting if I couldn't do that for some reason, uh, send email, which I probably, I always ran this monthly, so that was hard coded, but I really should make that a configuration or something so you can change the title of it. And that's where it sends the email, which with whatever SMTP server you were using. And that's it. This is the bottom part of the report. And you notice this is the part I told you about was the difference between the report generation and the stuff earlier. So uh, any questions before I show you the actual output? Nope, okay. All right, now. I uh, just opened this up ahead of time, just so I'd have it available. Um, you might not be able to read this specifically. Oh, yeah, good point. Whoops, too much, there we go. That's probably about good. All right, I only had one error. Again, I'm just doing this for demo purposes. I wanted something small and I couldn't connect. Uh, this is a domain that doesn't exist anymore that I deliberately left on my site for this presentation so that you could see an actual error. So it tells me, okay, this is the bad link. It tells me this is the page on my website that contains this bad link. In my case, it was only one. It more likely in the other website I was talking about, there's a whole slew of them. Um, and then, so this is the error report. Obviously, in this case, just one, so there's not very much. This is the link report, and you can either pick if you want both of them or you only want one or the other one. And so this, now you can see what I was saying. Okay, for this link to the, my client's page, guess what? That shows up on quite a few pages considering how sm small my site is. So um, if you'd see things like any kind of header or footer links, well, obviously that show up in a lot of places on a website because it's you know all over the place. Maybe it's in a, a footer for a site section or maybe it's across the whole website. So it may actually have a whole ton of stuff. So that's it. Any, uh, any questions? It, yes, sir. The report wouldn't show though if a page was linking to itself, right? Because you're, you're checking for that and you're not popping it up. 
That's correct. Yes, it would not uh, say that it was linking to itself because, yeah, it, was, it would toss it out as a duplicate. Uh, although without too much modification, I could actually check for that because I'm already, the anchor tags are a place where I'm expecting it to most of the time link to itself. It could be linking to an anchor on another page, but in our case, most of the time it was linking to the same page. So it was like a bunch of links at the top, linking to content that was, you know, below the fold, that sort of thing. So, uh, so without too much modification, I could actually check for that. So any other questions? Okay, that's it. Thanks for coming guys. Appreciate it. <laughs>